like to engage in a study that will be familiar to at least some of you, if not most of you, but is important for us because it helps us remember that God is overall and that God will bring every one of us into judgment, Hebrews 9.27. And thirdly, that there is a place, a reality that is reserved for those who die outside of Christ or are unfaithful to Him. We have just affirmed in a good song that I'll be a friend to Jesus. And it was Jesus who said, You're my friends if you do whatsoever I tell you. And every time I sing that song, I know I don't have to be concerned about Jesus being a friend to me, but I do have to be concerned about me always being a friend to Him because of the very words that Jesus said. Word studies are always interesting. And today I would like for us simply to look at the word hell as it appears in the King James Version. Now for some, as I said a moment ago, this will not be a new study. And yet it should be an interesting one because, and I'll refer to this later, Again, when you turn to Luke 16 and you have the account the Lord gave of the rich man and Lazarus, and again I say the King James Version, Jesus makes it clear that there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and designed to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And I won't finish out the account here because I'm zeroing in on the use of the word hell as the King James translators rendered it here. And we will develop it even further as we go. I read a thing sometime back that said, oh, the King James translators did a very bad job in rendering what is in the Greek known as Hades into the word hell. Well, I think that's an unfair criticism of them because of the time in which they did that translating. These people seem to have forgotten that uh, a language that is used is a living language. And words are dropped and words are added and words change in meaning. And during the time of the actual translation of the King James Version, then hell did not mean as we use it today, the final abode of the wicked after the day of judgment. Hell also meant an unseen place you had what was called even a hellier who was the one to put the roof on your house. And simply meaning a covered place, an unseen place. They had several usage of the term hell in those days that has completely been lost in modern English. So it is really not correct for somebody to say the King James translators did a bad job they may have done a better job, but they didn't do a bad job in view of the word hell and all the ways it was used at that time. 23 times, 23 is the word hell found in the King James Version. 10 times is the Greek word Hades translated hell in the King, in the King James Version. Now, there are some modern versions that just transliterate the word Hades into English. And, of course, it just says Hades. It's sort of like the word uh, baptizo. And thus, rather than give the actual meaning in a true translation to immerse, they just made a new word and said baptize or baptism. So you still don't know what Hades is unless you engage in a study. Any more than you know what hell is unless you engage in a study. 
Or for that matter, what the Bible has to say about heaven. So it's always necessary to take the totality of the information God has supplied and take the words and the various contexts they're found to try to determine what these things mean. And of course, sometimes we have uh, less knowledge given to us on certain subjects than we do on others, and the best we can do doesn't give us all we would like to know. There are a lot of things in the Bible like that, simply because God has written the Bible pertaining to your salvation and my salvation. And sometimes when it just does not um, in the life of somebody or the history of a nation or whatever, none of those things pertain to the revealing of how God saves man through Christ by the gospel. It just drops something in the middle of it. You come to the end of the book of Acts, I sure would like to know more about Paul. I would dearly love to know more about Paul in his own hired house. What all went on, but it didn't fit. It wasn't needed for the reason the Bible was written. So we always have to keep that in mind when it comes to studying these words. Now regarding the origin of Hades, I think I can safely say that the majority of scholars indicate it to be derived from two roots in the Greek language, the Koine Greek. Ah, the word alpha, or the letter alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, is a negative. And any time it appears before whatever else comes after it means not or no. And the word edine means to see. So if I've got a ah, before that, it's going to translate to English, not to see. Thus, in Thayer's Greek English lexicon, it has the idea of not to be seen. Not to be seen. That's the reason I said earlier that even hell back in the days is translating the King James Version in Elizabethan English carried with it more than just the final abode of the wicked. It carried with the idea of an unseen place. There are scholars such as Vine, and many of us have Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, he thinks it may have originated from hado, all receiving. But it doesn't change a thing about the full message that we have thus far seen because this place is an all receiving place of all spirits that have been separated from the body as James defines death, that the body apart from the spirit is dead. So when all is said and done, Again, we're back to what I said a moment ago. The meaning must be determined by the context in which it's found. Now, that takes a little while to study some of that. But I thought not only is it good to study the word hell in the King James Version, and going back to the original and the things I've just mentioned, but it also shows us how we might study any word and what is involved in it. And even how the English speaker, who doesn't really know any Greek at all, can benefit from the Greek through things like Vine and other uh, Greek-oriented commentaries to help them better understand what the Holy Spirit meant in these words. Suffice it to say there are different senses, different senses in which the Greek word Hades is used than in the New Testament. And let me give you some such as is. <laughs> Hades is used for the place of good and evil dead people following their deaths. Jesus declared that he held the key, that is, the key always standing for authority, to open. He had the keys of death. Remember, James says the body apart from the spirit is dead. So when the spirit, the real you, the inner you, the real man, when it leaves your body, that is death. And Hades, that is, he has the keys to death. And Hades, which is, according to Revelation 1 and verse 18, the place of the departed soul. Now, I've used the word soul, and I've used the word spirit. That means you have to look into the scriptures to see, is there a difference? Well, soul is more of a generic term. It can mean spirit. 
but it can mean the body or it can mean a composition of them. So I have to look at the context and know does soul mean spirit? We sing the song where the soul of man never dies. Well, we're meaning spirit there. And thus soul can mean spirit. But spirit as it pertains to the human spirit that now with us presently is living in each one of our bodies, the real you as I call it, then of course that's what we're talking about when we say that Hades is the place where those spirits go when they leave the body, which James says is death. In a vision, the apostle John saw death riding a pale horse. And he says it was followed by Hades, Revelation 6, 8. And of course, that ties in figuratively with the idea that it is literal that when the spirit leaves the body, which is death, then it goes into the place of departed spirits, which is the Hadean world. This is all before, as we talked about this morning, the end of time and at that time the resurrection of the body where the spirit is reunited with the body. At the final judgment, death and Hades then will be emptied, according to Revelation 20, 13 through 14. And that means the grave will give up the body and the spirit realm also will give up the spirits that are therein because of the nature of what resurrection is. Now you say, sure, I'd like to know a lot more about that. Well, I would too. But again, this is the reason I said in the beginning that we get what we can of the information explicitly provided in its context or context. And then we take all that information and we try to reason correctly with it that we might draw a conclusion that is correct. Now through the figure of speech known by grammarians as a synecdoche, where the whole is put for a part of the part for a whole, such as contend for the faith once for all to the saints. That's where a part is put for the whole New Testament system. Well, that's done elsewhere in the scriptures also. We see that Hades is used to reference a certain abode of, of the spirit world, and that's the point we're trying to make. Now, according to the context, this place may either be one of punishment or one of reward. That's the reason I began reading from Luke 16 a moment ago. And I'll go back to that now and look at verse uh, uh, 22 of Luke 16. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now that's a description of the Hadean world. You say, why does he say Abraham's bosom? Well, Jesus' audience was comprised of Jews. And their idea that if you could be as close as possible to Abraham, you're going to be with God and all that's holy and good and pleasant. And that was their terminology for paradise. So you had then the beggar being placed in a state of safety or salvation in a place of paradise. <clears throat> but not so with the rich man who's pictured as one really like a member of the church who has uh, quit living the Christian life because he's talking to Jews who are in covenant relationship with God. He's not talking to Jews and Gentiles. He's talking to those who are God's children. So this rich man was a man who was uh, living in sin who was one of the covenant children. So when he dies, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. And notice the description. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Well, of course, you can see he's tormented. And it's pictured as being tormented in the flame. Now there are those folks who will say, well, I thought uh, flames pertain to the, this material world. Well, if you can exist as a person, an entity, a person, outside the fleshly body in a realm that is not fleshly, then you can have a flame that fits the same situation. I've heard some people say, how can you have a flame, because they're thinking like a flame here, a flame gives off light. But yet, describing 
hell, Jesus said it's an outer darkness. So you got a contradiction. You got flame gives off light, and you got outer darkness. So how you can't have both of them? I heard one fellow answer this, and I think it's answering a fool according to his way. You ever heard of an oven? So, so that's that's the way it works. We can't judge these things as the, the way things work here. Besides that, he's commenting to us for our benefit, so we can get some sort of grasp with our finite minds of what lies beyond. The same thing's true of trying to understand paradise, Abraham's bosom, or to understand the final abode of the resurrected blessed, as we talked about this morning, and that is heaven itself. So you have a place of punishment that one goes to dying in sin, when one dies, of course, or a place of reward. Now, regarding the foregoing, Jesus warned that the wicked people of the city of Capernaum, that is, those who had rejected the Lord's teaching, would go down into Hades, Matthew eleven twenty three 23, and Luke 10, 15. Now, they're going to go, having rejected the Lord's teaching, right to the place the rich man went. When the hard-hearted rich man died, thus we see that he went to that place of Hades reserved for those who die lost in a place of anguish and horror and torment, Luke 16, 23 through 24. Also following our Lord's death, as his body was in Joseph's tomb, his spirit, or we can say here soul, now that I've explained, soul and, and spirit, is in Hades, Acts 2, 27 through 31. So the spirit had Peter and the other apostles preach, and Luke infallibly recorded what they said. He did not leave his soul in Hades. Now the King James would say hell. But now we know why the King James translators did it, and we know now what the Greek word actually said. Luke 23, 43, that place is called Paradise. That's where the rich man rent the day that Christ and the rich, or not the rich man, the, the thief, I'd rather call him insurrectionist, that he died in Luke 23, 43. Now, I want you to think about that just for a moment. Thou shalt be with me in paradise. With me. That means consciousness. I pause here to say that because there are people who think that when you die, you're unconscious. You don't know anything. Well, when he says, thou shalt be with me in paradise, means you're going to be aware that I'm there with you. Now, if you're unconscious, you don't know who's with you. And uh, anybody that's ever had surgery or for some reason been put to sleep, you didn't know who was in that room. And you certainly hoped that you were deep enough sleep you didn't know what was going on until they were ready to wake you up. Now, of course, the atheist says you just cease to be. And I think probably they're thinking about you just go unconscious like when you're in a very deep sleep. But I think you've got to realize an atheist is saying there is no such thing as the metaphysical or as we say the spiritual. And when you're dead, that's just a physical going out of existence, an annihilation. You literally, it's not a matter of being unconscious, but you, you cease to exist. You just are gone. I want you to sometimes stop and think about that for a minute. Just ceasing to be. What meaning does that give to your life here on this earth? Just ceasing to be. When Robert Dale Owen came over to America, a great atheist of his day that Alexander Campbell debated, He came to Campbell's farm, and they walked over Campbell's farm as they talked about the particulars about the debate that was upcoming. And Owen told Campbell, said, you know, we atheists, I think he actually used the word infidel, we have no fear of death. And the reason why was what I've just stated, you know, you soup, you, there's no hell, there's no heaven, you just are gone. Campbell retorted by pointing out a bull standing over in the shade. He says, 
Well, you're like that bull. He has no fear of death either. But neither does he have any hope of life. There is built in every person, whether these atheists will admit it or not, the longing desire and the wonderment about what lies after death. And though they will come out to be consistent with their logic, that there's nothing, you just go out of existence. There is that haunting. Always. Now, question. If all we are is matter that's developed to where we are physically over multiplied billions of years of chance evolution from dead rocks and dirt, matter, where would there ever be with a wherewithal to conjure up an idea of a heaven or a hell or an afterlife or anything? How does a rock contemplate such a thing as that? I don't care whether it's evolved into matter in motion, and that's all you would be. A thought, if you're, if you're just matter in motion, a thought is nothing but molecules running into one another or atoms in your brain. And you had an idea, well, you had to run in some sort of wreck in your head, and that's what an idea is. None of that fits anything that I know of that really makes sense if you begin to pressure these fellows and press them on the logical outcome of their position. But Abraham's bosom is synonymous with paradise. And that's a place of comfort. Now, I would like to know more about the comforting part of it. That's what's amazing about the Bible. It uses a word that's perfectly adequate, comfort. He's comforted. Well, what all does that mean, Luke 16, 22, and 25? Well, if you look at it, you'll see in uh, verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, not tormented. Well, that still leaves my mind wanting to more, more about the details of comfort. Now, it can't be a physical thing because they're not in a material world. So whatever comfort there is, it's something that comes different from what any kind of comfort you can think of in this world. I can get some ideas from the rest of the scriptures. And we studied some about that this morning, considering what the Apostle Paul said about his time of departure being at hand. Because he was going to depart into right where Lazarus went and uh, where the thief went. That's called paradise. Well, we are so involved with the way we live in this body that I don't think sometimes we even give thought to the fact that the whole state of existence is going to cease. It's not going to be any matter of how you feel physically because there's no feel physically there. There's not going to be any tomorrow. There's not going to be anything that can make you anxious. I'm speaking of one saved, of course, in paradise. Comforted. When you think of work, when you think of paying bills, when you think of family obligations, when you think of privations brought upon you simply by being a Christian, what you have to keep yourself from, what you make sure you involve yourself in, there's no more a concern about evil companionship corrupts good morals. None of that's there. There's no more examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. That's not there anymore. Nothing there is like here in the sense of the design and purpose of life in the flesh which is a place to prove to God we love him and that we are going to be tenacious about being a friend of Jesus and the only way you can and that is keep his commandments so that's completely removed is the way we exist and our outlook on life now memory of course goes with us you remember that Abraham did not have trouble saying to the rich man son remember that's going to make hell worse, whether it's the place where he's tormented now or the final abode of the wicked after the day of judgment. Because you will remember how you misused and abused this life that God gave you to find him, to learn of his salvation, and to serve him according to the truth of God's word. Now, when Christ promised to build his church, you'll remember that he said the gates of Hades, or hell as it said in the King James Version, would not prevail against it. 
So Jesus made it clear that Hades is not going to him personally keep his soul from carrying out the promise, I will build my church because he's going to rise from the dead. Hades was meant for a place because sin's in the world and sin causes death, but Christ had no sin, so when he died, he died on behalf of others, and thus when he went into the Hadean world, it could not hold him. I think sometimes we forget that situation. That's why we read earlier that death and Hades are cast into the lake of fire. Hades is simply for the time of time, a place to hold the spirits of those awaiting the end of the world, the coming of Christ, and the judgment. Outside the bodies we read about this morning in 2 Corinthians 5. And yet God in His wisdom has said there's a place for those spirits who die lost and a place for those spirits who die saved or as babies, innocent. And there they are awaiting the final end of all things and the judgment. And you say, well, why do you have them already, that is the lost, already being punished? Well, first of all, you've got to realize that there can be no final judgment until this world is over and done with and the place of your influence for good or bad has ceased. Now, to bring it home to us, when you die, if you die today, your influence for good or bad doesn't end. Their works do follow them. Whatever kind of character you were in this life, your influence for good as the Bible defines good or bad as the Bible defines bad is going to continue on. Think about the wicked people like uh, Stalin and Hitler and all sorts of people like that. The Bible's even preserved people like Ahab and Jezebel. Think about Judas. Think about all of those who fall into those kinds of categories. Their influence still continues. Now, the way they died personally, then they're going to where they deserve, even as the rich man did and as Lazarus did, who's pictured as a saved person and was. But the full meeting out according to your works can't be done until the place of your influence ceases to be. And that's the end of the world when it's destroyed. That's why final judgment comes there. Then you can receive according to your works. But you cannot receive according to your works until the place of your influence is over and done with. You need to keep that in mind as you search the scriptures. So Jesus declared that his church would ultimately enjoy victory over death. In the, at the same time or at the time of the general resurrection, the end of the material world. So Hades, death, is not going to stop Jesus from building his church that he promised to build, Matthew 16, 18. And it's not going to stop the church from experiencing the great victory. Again, read Revelation. That's the very point when you put it all together. You remain faithful, Revelation 2.10, even if it costs you your life and you're put to death because of your faithfulness. And I will give you a crown of life. So, this thing cannot hurt the person who dies faithful. Peter wrote that God spared not angels when they sinned, but cast them down to hell and committed them to pits of darkness to be received under judgment. So we see it's not only humans but also angels. Now, that's another one of those cases. If you want to have a good study and end up knowing some things but wish you knew a whole lot more, is just get into a study of what the Bible has to say about angels. Be that as it may, coming from 2 Peter 2, 4, what I just read, we see that in this passage, the word hell is from the Greek word tartarosos. It's a participle. The noun form is tartarus. Now, this in Peter here is the only place in the New Testament that this particular word is found. Originally, Tartarus meant a deep place, 
And it carries that significance even back over in the Old Testament in Job 40, 13, 41, 31. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is the Septuagint or the LXX. If you look further back into ancient Greek, you'll find that the Greek poet Homer wrote of dark Tartarus, the deepest pit in the Iliad. And here it ref references the dwelling place of evil angels because they're sentencing to Gehenna, their final abode. And that's what you get into in Matthew 25, 41, concerning the final abode of the wicked after the day of judgment, depart from me, I never knew you into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. However, the Greeks applied the word to the place of the wicked dead. So you remember the Holy Spirit had those people take what's known as koine, the common Greek, and then employ these words as they had developed and come down at that time, and Greek was a living language, and they used it at that time. Shortly thereafter, as far as history is concerned, Greek became a dead language, and those words are frozen with the meanings they had at the time the New Testament was written. And it doesn't change. Now, Greek's a hard language to study, but at least you got one upmanship on that. When you go to the Greek New Testament, you can find those words, and you can count them, and you can know they're used, as I said on this one, uh, Tartarus used one time here or whatever. So it never changes. So there's no reason to conclude otherwise from Peter's writing that uh, he's talking about the place of the wicked dead in view of what he said, the actual knowledge that's given in those words. We conclude that it references that part of Hades where the rich man was, where wicked men and angels are punished until the judgment day at the end of the material world in the universe. 2 Peter 2.9 reads, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And you might want to compare the American Standard Version 1901 and the New King James Version with the King James here. Under punishment is a present participle. Revealing the penalty, that the penalty was already being inflicted at the time Peter wrote. Now from other places in the scriptures we can conclude that that punishment is being inflicted for the time that a person who's wicked dies. But just as it's translated here, the King James tends to suggest in this passage that, that this comes after the judgment. Well, no, it doesn't. Uh, we know that from other passages of Scripture. So we need to make, take note of that and a full study of the matter as to this punishment is going on at this present time. And which, of course, meant at the time that Peter wrote. Tartarus is the name of the Hades then where the rich man, was being tormented, Luke 16, 23. Now remember, we're looking at hell as it appears in the King James Version. So we've already seen different Greek words that are translated hell, but they don't always mean the same thing. Because hell in our day and time is used in one of two ways. It's a cuss word, or it's used to mean the final abode of the wicked at the end of time after the judgment. But then we come to Gehenna. And this is the Greek word that designates the final and eternal abode of those who die separated from God, those who are sentenced at the judgment, the resurrection of the wicked dead. It's found some 12 times in the New Testament. And it's interesting to note that in 11 of these places where it finds usage, it is Jesus himself who uses that term. And let me nail this down. Jesus, our Savior, who loved us and came from the loving Father, who loved us to the uttermost of suffering, bleeding, and dying, being tempted in every point, like as we are, yet without sin. The Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. He it is that talks more about hell, the final abode of the wicked, than any, anybody else. Well, it ought to be common if you think about it because he's come to save us from hell. Wouldn't he talk about the place he's come to save us from? Ge Gehenna is a transliteration of the Old Testament Hebrew expression, the Valley of Hinnom. 
Now this came from the name of a, they call it a valley, we'd call it more of a ravine on the southern side of Jerusalem. This place was used during the days of apostate Israel as a location where apostate Jews offered children on the firearms of the pagan god Molech, 2 Chronicles 28.3 and 33.6. Thus it became known as a place of horror, a place of anguish, of terrible suffering and weeping. And under King Josiah's reforms, then this ravine or, or valley was known as the place of horrible abominations, 2 Kings 23, 10 through 14. Finally, it became Jerusalem's garbage dump where there was a continual burning of all manner of garbage. You know, some of us remember the days when each town had its garbage dump, an open garbage dump. People don't remember that much anymore. But I remember taking stuff in Camden. We'd pile up much stuff, take it to the garbage dump. For a fee, you'd dump everything in there. Never went there. That number one, awful stench. All kinds of dead things at various stages of decomposing. Buzzards everywhere, maggots here and there, fires going up all the time, 24 hours a day, and the smoke ascending. Now, does that begin to tell you why that Gehenna was adopted and used by the Holy Spirit to describe the eternal torment of the wicked in hell? So it's a symbolic designation for the place of suffering in which wicked, sinful, evil people and angels reside forevermore following our Lord's return in the judgment. Of Gehenna, and we won't be able to go into all of this, our Lord several times spoke in the Sermon on the Mount. I won't begin to list all of these, Matthew 5, 22, 29 through 30, and so on. But again, our Lord warns us by having much to say about the very place He's come to keep us out of. But it takes our cooperation with God, which means we must receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. We must have a disposition of heart, such as Luke 8, 15, an honest and good heart that receives the word, brings forth fruit in obedience to the gospel. As Paul would say, I fought the fight of faith. I've kept it. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Well, what about people like the rich man? Remember, as Abraham told him to remember, that, you know, first of all, you can't come over here where we are, and nobody can come from where we are to you, because he had asked that Lazarus be sent over with the tip of his finger dipped in water and touch it to my, flame, and my tongue, for I'm tormenting this flame. Now, that's not the Gehenna hell. It's Tartarus, place of torment. But when he said, son, remember... You remember how you lived on earth. And in effect, he's saying, you prepared yourself for this place. You chose to come to this place. And immediately, well, since I can't get out of this mess and nobody can help me, he remembers that I have five brethren back there on earth, which tells us also it can't be the final abode of the wicked after the earth's destroyed because he has five brethren back here on earth. And they're in a position to repent and change their lives. But he's not satisfied with the word of God to accomplish what God said he would accomplish. Send Lazarus back to them. He ain't testifying to them not to come to this place of torment. Well, they're Jews and they approach God under the law. So Abraham, who never was under the law of Moses, but he's the father of the faithful, tells them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they hear one though he rose from the dead. That ought to tell us something. And then I pause and think, that's going on right now. Every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every week, thousands are entering unprepared into eternity. And lifting their eyes, they in their agony cry out. That ought to shake anybody up. To use our lives to be obedient to God and draw near to Him. And the only way it's possible to love the truth to know it and to do it. For someday we must all stand before the judgment bar of Christ 
And there we receive the full reward for evil or good. And bodies fitted for eternal damnation where the worm dieth not. And the fires are not quenched. Or in glory beyond the mind of mortal man to grasp at this time. All dependent on how we live our lives here. So I hope this short journey with this word study has helped make us mindful of not only the importance of word study and the right division of the word in our study of the Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15, but to realize the value of using our lives that we will never be in Tartarus or certainly not in Gehenna. If you go into Tartarus, the place where the rich man went, you're going at the resurrection into Gehenna. God forbid that such should happen. Just had uh, news from the constable telling my wife about a man who just day or two ago or shortly committed suicide not far from us over another neighborhood. And he said that he went in and hanged himself because he was just so tired of the pain here. Can you imagine? And I can't. What he thought he was getting out of and what he put himself into. Whatever pain and anguish there is here, and especially brought upon us if we're suffering for righteousness sake, it does not begin, does not begin begin to touch the hem of the garment with the anguish of those who die lost, separated from God. And then you have your memory of all those things you should have done and could have done and all the people you influenced for bad. And not only raising your eyes in torment, but then to see your family coming as they walk in your footsteps and you claim to love them so much but you would not walk the straight and narrow way of truth. There's not a soul in Tartarus right now that wants to see anybody coming there at all, but especially their own flesh and blood as it was here in this life. Beloved, if you need to obey the gospel, then now's the time to do it. Believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. Then to live faithful, not be as the rich man who violated the covenant, but live faithful. And if there's some part of your life that's amiss, humble yourself, repent of it, draw strength, rise up with zeal to persevere and be faithful unto death. And there will be a home beyond the mortal mind to grasp, a place of comfort and rest. And where there must be such a sigh of relief the moment the Spirit leaves and is escorted by a band of angels, as was Lazarus, into that grand place known as Abraham's bosom and the paradise of God to await the great resurrection in which we shall all be able to hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys. Oh, what does that mean? of thy Lord. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.